Today's guest is Lee Steinberg, simply the best agent to ever represent professional and amateur athletes in the history of sports, in my opinion. He is the idea behind Jerry Maguire because he lived a life similar to Jerry Maguire, the character in the movie. And you'll hear so much from him today, not just about what he's doing in the game of sports, but the life he's lived as an example for all of us. Stay tuned for more. Three. Here to score it for us is the master of disaster public relations specialist, Mike Paul. Mike Paul, known as the reputation doctor. Well, there's a court of law and there's a court of public opinion. Mike Paul is a crisis PR and reputation management expert. Is all about reputation. Got some tips on rebuilding those reputations. You first have to be transparent and then be accountable for your actions. He's got to get on a truth train right now. There's no ifs or buts in a true apology. You must speak directly to the issues that you've been involved with. You're going to have to have an across-the-board solution that is more than words, and you got to have actions. Let's do this. Our guest today is Lee Steinberg from Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. Lee, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Mike. So listen, Lee is one of the top agents in sports, in my opinion, in the history of sports. He was also the man and the idea behind an amazing movie, Jerry Maguire. That must have been some experience, Lee, being involved with that. Let's talk about that just for a minute. Any tidbits you haven't really shared thus far that you might want to share here? Well, it was 1993, and writer-director Cameron Crowe called me and asked if he could follow me around for a movie that would be based on a sports agent. So he began this journey, and uh, we went through it largely together, where he went with me to the 1993 draft, where I had Drew Bledsoe as the first uh, pick. He came to Pro Scouting Day at USC to lead meetings to uh, – a variety of different events. He sat in my office and I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. So then my job as technical advisor was to vet the script to make sure that you weren't jarred out of the willing suspension of disbelief that holds you in a motion picture. And uh, then I took some of the actors like Cuba Gooding Jr. and put him in role because he came down to the Pro Bus Super Bowl with me. And I made him pretend he was a wide receiver for all that week with Desmond Howard and Amani Toomer. And then I actually had to show the quarterback in the film, Jerry O'Connell, how to throw a spiral because he had gone to NYU and, and they don't have a football program. So uh, it's been uh, many, many years where every time I go out to dinner or walk into an airport, someone runs up to me full speed and either asks me to say or says those four words that start with, show me the... <laughs> what an amazing experience that must have been. Um, well, as you know, the name of the program is, is Reputations in Crisis, and that includes individuals, that includes organizations, uh, and, and in various sectors of life. And of course, today we're talking about sports. You know, I wanna start with, i uh, just so blessed to get to know you uh, be, both of us being talking heads for, for so many years in the media. And the only sad part about that relationship, uh, besides seeing you occasionally at, uh, at parties and sports, is we didn't have the opportunity many times to share the green room. And now, of course, we're doing more digital uh, interviews. So I'm just blessed that you're, you're on the show today. So thank you for that. I want to ask a few questions that are uh, pretty hard hitting. There's a lot of things happening in sports these days. Uh, my first question is, in your opinion, what do you think the current reputation of the NFL is? There are some that think that the NFL is in crisis for a number of different reasons. There are some that are saying that the game continues to evolve. There's so many issues that affect a reputation and a brand from a crisis perspective. What is your opinion of the reputation of the NFL today? Well, I think it's better than it was during Ray Rice or the Tom Brady situation. They just renewed contracts with the three major networks, which almost double 
the amount of revenue coming. So pro football continues to be the country's passion, the most popular sport. And 71 of the top 100 Nielsen primetime shows last year were NFL nighttime football. So it's not only the most popular sport, it's the most popular television show. Here's the problem. News is reported in terms of what's aberrational. Uh, dog bites man is not a story. Man bites dog is a story. And so every time a player has difficulties off the field, it resonates and is shown in repetitive fashion over and over and over again. And it's caught up in the news cycle. And so you hear about the story uh, a million times, whether it's drunk driving or domestic abuse, whatever the issue is, we see this and it's, there's no context. The backdrop being that there are a couple thousand NFL players and uh, 1,995 of them don't get in trouble uh, all year or have any difficulties. That when someone wakes up in the morning with their own wife, drives to the ballpark, gives peak performance, graciously signs autographs, and then goes to work on their charitable foundation off the field. That's not news. News is any aberration to it. So you can have a tendency for people to think that the behavioral patterns of athletes have somehow descended. When we know through testing that less players than ever before use performance enhancing drugs, less players use uh, uh, illegal drugs, less players drive drunk, all the rest of it. We, we test at the combine, we do scrutiny into their backgrounds, but that might not be the perception that someone in public has because they'll pick up the newspaper and the sports page reads like the business section or even worse, like the crime beat section. And each aberrational incident is, is over and over and over again repeated. So you get the effect that once you've seen Michael Vick for the 50th time associated with uh, dog fighting, you believe that that's who he is all the time. That's what he does. And, uh, and all athletes must be dog, uh, have dog fighting uh, uh, interests. Lee, let me push back a little bit on that. I, I agree with you 100%, by the way, but... You know, I work with professional athletes and, and Olympic athletes and some amateur athletes as well. And of course, being an agent is different than being an attorney, which is different than being someone who's in charge of their reputation in the court of public opinion only. Um, but that being said, here's what I tell athletes. To get that money, to get that branding, to get that reputation, you also sign a social contract that your agent or your manager or your family or your coaches might not ever talk to you about. Good agents like you do, but I make sure they understand before draft day, while they're still in college if I'm working with them that, that young, or when they have a crisis, it's one of the first things out of my mouth to say, you give up a lot to gain that. There's a price to be paid. Now, also in other sectors, business professionals, politicians, Cops today, there's great cops. There's also bad cops. There are good athletes. From a playing perspective, there are some that have better behavior off the field. So isn't part of the analysis also for them to understand that, yeah, it sucks that you have to be positioned that way, but it's going to happen. The media is going to repeat it a thousand times, and they're not going to show the good worker in a company, the good cop who's also out there playing basketball with kids sometimes, once or three times a week. They're not going to only talk about your charities. They're going to highlight your worst behavior always, which is why you have to live your life as though you're on the front page of the newspaper or you're on CNN and the camera's following you. So that's exactly what I tell a young athlete the first time they walked into my office that they're playing a sport where people are having a choice as to whether to watch a game on television, whether to buy memorabilia, whether to play fantasy sports. And it 
puts upon them a, a, a stronger responsibility to tailor their behavior in a socially acceptable way. And if they don't want that responsibility, they can go play on the sandlot and no one will criticize them. But if they want to be in pro sports, so the first thing we talk about is the athlete is role model. And I tell young men that they have this marvelous opportunity to retrace their roots and go back to the high school community, set up a scholarship fund, work for a church or a boys and girls club and network and lay down roots there. And at the collegiate level, after all the alums primarily relate to the school through the football and basketball program. And if they'll go back, Edger and James repaid his scholarship at the University of Miami, Troy Aikman at UCLA, Warren Moon at the University of Washington, and establish a tie there. And then is there some problem in life that they always wish they had an opportunity to, to address? And so I'll sit with them and say, let's listening is really important in what we yes. do. It's really getting in the heart and mind and seeing the world the way the other person sees it and understanding that our deepest anxieties and fears and greatest hopes and dreams. So can we set up a charitable foundation, which encompasses the leading business figures in the city, the leading political figures, the community leaders on an advisory board. And now let's execute a program. So Warwick Dunn just put the 175th single mother and their family into the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment and uh, outfitting it. And athletes can change lives. So we only take those clients that are willing to do that and understand that self-absorption is their ultimate enemy and being out empowerment as someone who's got other skills than athletic ones has the ability to do things. And this also lays the genesis for second career. But I will tell you what we do in crisis control. If an incident occurs with an athlete, the first thing we do is prevention. So, the first point to it is to tell an athlete, if you go out into a place that serves alcohol, you either have to have a bunch of friends with you as, as sort of buffers so you're not getting into fights, and you cannot drive. If you are interacting with any other human being, especially a woman, you can't put your hands on them in anger. Um, you can't use performance-enhancing uh, substances. So prevention is the best cure. But now let's suppose that someone has had a drunk driving or, a, or some untoward incident. The first thing to do is to wrap your arms around all the facts so that anything you do or say will not be contradicted later. It won't right. look this. So first of all, Wait until you understand what all the issues are. Second of all, I always have a fight with criminal attorneys because my point to them is if you're convicted of drunk driving, what will happen? You'll, you'll go through a series of things, but your reputation is critical. And if you have this incident, so the first thing we ask them to do is to get out pretty quickly and make an apology and state the standard of behavior. I know it's wrong to drive with any kind of alcohol in my system. I know it's wrong to um, uh, put my hands on anyone in anger. And then apologize to the relevant constituencies, which are the public, the team, the players, the owner, the fans, and understand that you've let them down. And then importantly, show that you've taken steps to prevent a recurrence, that this is not just a hollow apology. So I'm going to AA to deal with my alcohol problem. I'm going to anger management. In other words, what is the action that you're taking to prevent a recurrence so that there's no recidivism? And so that formula is allows the healing to begin. But when an athlete protests um, that they didn't do it when they clearly did, they, if they did it, there's nothing wrong with it. 
um, uh, and if they let too much time pass, then that incident gets recycled and recycled. So um, my responsibility is to make sure someone doesn't have an alcohol problem. And if they do, they address it. My responsibility is to make sure they go to anger management. They understand that this isn't acceptable. And now the healing can begin. And as much as the general public um, uh, loves the fall of the high and mighty, it also loves the comeback. So if enough time passes, the player's still playing, no other untoward incidents have occurred, over time, there's healing. This pandemic, as you know, is affecting black families and black people two to four times worse than whites. I've had to educate in every sector since March. March 6th is my birthday. Last year, March 6th, I started getting messages before things were hitting the news around the 13th through the 16th. Um, and we were getting early data that this is worse for people of color. You must have been told stories by some of the people that you represent that their mom died or their dad died or an auntie or a cousin died. Can you talk a bit about that and, and what has that experience been as you are helping them with issues like bad behavior and drugs and addictions and um, other struggles. This was not their fault. And some close members of their family must have passed away. How did you handle that? And how are you still handling that? Because this pandemic isn't over. So mortality and actually losing a loved one is the most inexplicable, hard to understand uh, concept there is. Um, and so I encourage people to get counseling uh, if they were going through a difficult situation in terms of the disproportionate amount of, of cases and deaths in uh, uh, communities with people of color. We've tried in California to compensate for that by making sure that vaccines went into uh, minority communities at higher rates before the general population uh, uh, got it. And so the key is if you see the need there, you need to uh, address it. And one of the greatest things about athletes is the opportunity to role model and trigger imitative behavior. So let's take domestic violence. I represented the boxer Lennox Lewis, and we had him cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women. So that could do more to deal with the behavioral aspects of rebellious adolescence than a thousand authority figures ever could, because she was a big macho person telling you, you have to treat um, uh, if you're a man, women with uh, extra care and, and uh, sensitivity. So in the same way, sports has a role to play here because athletes can post pictures of them getting a shot. They can, they can do PSAs. They can model mask wearing. They can do all sorts of things that will have an effect on the communities they come from. And so they need to be in the forefront of, of uh, and use that high profile uh, in, in a way that, that helps other people. But that's one thing if, if I totally agree with you to use your celebrity for good, but have any of your athletes lost a family member to COVID? And it yeah. starts with that pain first before they can think of, utilizing their celebrity if it especially if it happened in a family and, and with someone close is there is there anybody who has lost anyone to COVID that you know we had a client who lost his father and the most painful part of the whole situation is that because of the way hospitals are treating COVID the person dies by themselves and so death is horrifying enough, but being surrounded by your close family members um, uh, must make the moment um, more manageable and, and uh, endowed with some special aspect. But 
Um, you can't even visit the COVID person in the hospital and they die alone. And coming to terms with that, not being able to say goodbye in a personal way, really is uh, uh, an extra burden and, and, and hard to understand. And then it's the suddenness of which yes. is someone goes from seemingly being healthy in two weeks to not being on this planet. So um, part of what you have to do with athletes is understand, first of all, them holistically as human beings and to understand who they are as a person and to help chart a life plan for them. But this is a business of young men um, and some young women. And so we're dealing with young people who, who are maturing before our eyes, but also are particularly vulnerable to the concept that these young, healthy athletes would have people in their families that actually get stricken by something they can't see and then uh, die. And, and there was very little preparation in this country for the fact the pandemic was coming. So it's had psychological effects on people all across the society. Let's talk about another uh, painful issue in society right now. Uh, by the way, one of the things that uh, I've decided, and this is a brand new show, and I'm, uh, and I'm glad you're on, uh, I'm gonna wear a t-shirt under a sports jacket or alone every show and I'm asking people from uh, uh, their charitable organizations or um, even just icons that are in society that are helping people who seek to change the world to send me t-shirts and we'll, we'll wear a t-shirt each week. So if you have something for the future, I'd love to have you come back as well. I'd, I'd be happy to wear it. The f today's is a guy you've seen before. This is, you, you see it's it's got a, a, a couple of those little wrinkles in there where you put it through the dryer a number of times. So this, this is when he first started his protest. Callan Kaepernick uh, t-shirt. Black Lives Matters has not only influenced society, but has influenced the game of football and sports. Um, not just male sports, but female sports as well. And, and kids sports, or not just in the United States, but around the world. What do you think of his movement then and now, and not only its impact on sports, but on society? Remember now you're talking to the former student body president of Berkeley. Uh, and and my, my whole life, uh, you know, has been about fighting for justice in one form or another. My dad had me out uh, when I was a teen in the civil rights movement, you know, marching. <laughs> so uh, th this fight goes on. Social change doesn't occur rapidly sometimes. It, it, right. it, it's a commitment that you have to have to never give up and to always keep the fight going. So I think that Kaepernick understood that he was taking a risk. And I always admire people who take that risk. Now, at the end of the day, it brings up this compelling question. Now, if you've protested and protested and made your point, then it's got to translate into action. So at a certain level, you can protest, you can symbolically, but let's figure out what to do. Let's figure out what each person can do in the face of this problem. It's also answering it from the perspective of the lead. The NFL, with all due respect, wasn't as open to that until most recently. One of the reasons why Colin did what he did wasn't for the athletes. He was hoping the athletes would join in, and some did, and some didn't. And there were some athletes who had some positioning, sadly, as bad as cops who have done wrong. But you have a league that, got to give them credit where credit is due, has certainly changed in some aspects of race relations as an organization and as a league led by, as you know, a lot of attorneys who are behind the scenes at the NFL to understand that society is changing and you have to change along with it. Some people think they haven't done enough yet, but part of that change in those protests that still continue to this day, and by the way, we got an Olympic Games, trust me, there's going to be protests. 
Uh, I've worked with Olympic athletes for, for many years. The Japanese organizers of the Olympic Games are saying, you know, no protests, no this, no that. Okay, you just put a mark on you to have even more. That's not going to happen. Um, what is the message? And you have young agents that are going through your academy to learn how to be agents now, uh, which I think is a, a terrific program that you have. There's so many different messages that come from this. And ultimately, again, it's not so much about that. It's about changing your heart. What's your message from that perspective? There, there's got, it's not going to be the same issue, but there's going to be important issues where sports can continue to have a huge impact. And you talk about taking a stand. Um, let me ask this question. I tell athletes and all types of clients business professionals, politicos, you name it. You're gonna get on a slippery slope if you don't think of something bigger than yourself and not just think of it, lean on it. For some people it's faith, for some people it's their family, for some people it's a sponsor or a mentor. What do you have to say about that when we know that the average person's gonna have some type of struggles in their life and what are some of the bullet points, the core beliefs that's gonna help them when they experience it? Well, I think it's helpful to see your role in life as helping others. I think it's helpful to understand, as we said before, that at the end of life, what will you have had? You'll have had what impact you made on other people. I believe that that um, fighting for what's right and helping other people is God's work. I think that that's the reason we're on this uh, planet. And so it's did you make a difference? Did you make a positive difference? Um, I asked my father at the end of uh, when I was young what he had done in World War II to keep the world safe from, uh, from um, fascism. And our kids are going to ask us, did you know, whether it's the environment, did you understand that, that the oceans were rising? Did you understand that the planet was becoming less inhabitable? For the people on it, it's not about the earth dying. The earth will be fine. It's about our species, which is this tiny little flicker in time. So, you know, when you watch George Floyd and that video, what did you actually do? Um, what, what did you actually do? So in a practical terms, um, I went to the Anti-Defamation League at B'nai B'rith and said, can we do a training program that will train young professionals in how to spot skinheads and hate groups and how to help police departments in crisis situations, how to intervene, how to do intelligence work, and then how to go into school systems and design programs that help with racial harmony and help people build a healthy respect for the differences in others. And we trained them for a year and created thousands of these people out there. Wow. Everyone in their own way, in their own time. And so I can sleep a little better knowing the fight against hate is going on out there and that there are people in that are specifically trained. But the point is, what specifically can you do? Maybe it's just living well in your own life. Maybe it's just being a good parent. Maybe it's raising kids who are not prejudiced. Maybe it's, um, uh, but what action did you take? Because see, at a certain perspective, we can't, I think it's important to protest. I think it's important to make your point, but talk about a slippery slope. If we use the stadium, which brings in people from disparate political, educational, racial, religious groups all together, um, finding their commonality and rooting for a team. And we use it for one purpose, then do born again Christians who believe that abortion is murder and a country that countenances that, do they next use the stadium? Are they holding up pictures of dead fetuses? And then it does the next group and the next group. And all of a sudden, people who go to sports as an escape from their real life problems um, uh, push it away. It, it's important to balance using the sport to create social change 
but not force feeding so much into people that you push them away. Of all the athletes, Lee, that you've worked with, and we, we talked about some of the tools that are necessary to have a lasting brand and reputation by leaning on what I call the path to truth, getting on the truth train. Who's done it best? Well, I have to go to Warren Moon, uh, who uh, has had a life with a few ups and downs, but, but first of all, he went back to his high school, set up a scholarship fund. Then he went to his college and set up a scholarship fund. And then he set up the Crescent Moon Foundation, which sends uh, young people of color to college uh, on his scholarships. And that has functioned in Houston and Kansas City and Seattle and Minneapolis. Um, and um, symbolically, at a time when there was major prejudice in the NFL, against the so-called thinking positions being occupied by uh, uh, African-Americans. Um, so you didn't have black quarterbacks, you didn't have black centers, you didn't have black safeties, you didn't have black middle linebackers. And there was this not stated, but underlying uh, resistance to allowing them. He had to go to Canada for six years and play there because he didn't think he was going to get a fair shot in the NFL. Well, he comes back after six years of starring up there as the highest paid player in uh, the National Football League, has a long, illustrious career, plays for 23 years, and uh, at the end of it is the first African-American quarterback in the modern era to ever be inducted into the Pro Hall of Fame. So I... I've gone to houses with younger black quarterbacks and seen his picture on their wall. And so in terms of every kind of role modeling you could do, uh, Warren's been there. Um, he was part of the million person virtual environmental um, march on Washington. He and I cut a PSA for the Sierra Club. So whatever the issue, uh, he's been there. And uh, uh, you know, he's had a few of his own bumps, but part of what we have to teach here is resilience, that life will knock you back. Notwithstanding your best intentions, things may go awry. And, and the question is not whether you're going to get knocked back or knocked over. It's uh, are you going to be resilient? Um, I'm a person who, if I walk into a barn filled with uh, defecation. Uh, I'm sure there must be a pony under there somewhere. <laughs> There's got to be light at the end of the tunnel. There's going to be a better day. And if you stay in process, just keep doing those things necessary to perfect your craft, fight an addiction, whatever it is, just stay in the process. Stop worrying about the results. Eventually, life will brighten you. I see this amazing picture that I've seen before of you with Cuba Gooding Jr. and Tom Cruise over your shoulder. And there are two highlights in uh, the film, Jerry Maguire, that people thought, the like a lot of films, they think it's about something and then the moral of the story is something totally different. It wasn't just a movie about sports. Um, it was a movie about connections and relationships and one of the Obviously, the, the big lines for the movie is uh, Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise, uh, saying to Kubi Gooden Jr., who was a receiver, help me to help you. I am out here for you. You don't know what it's like to be me out here for you. It is an up at dawn, pride swallowing siege that I will never fully tell you about, okay? Help me! Help me, Rod. Help me! Help you. Help me help you. Help me help you. Then you flip it back in another section in the movie, and Kubi Gidding Jr. at his wedding says, You didn't have the talk, did you? 
What was that about? How was that a lesson for us all? We have professional athletes who come from very different backgrounds, some of them uh, in their family life. And what was the character trying to say to Jerry Maguire about the importance of family? That when all is said and done, um, um, the vicissitudes of life will um, uh, blind you to what's really important. And at the end of the day, again, it's, were you a good father? Were you a good brother? Were you good to your parents? Were you there in times of crisis for them? Do you, do you understand what's important? That love is what is critically important and relationships. And at the end of the day, it's about heart. It's about uh, empathy. It's about understanding the difficulties of other people as well as yourself. And um, it, uh, it's just a, a, a prompt on what from a value standpoint is, is really important and not getting lost, uh, not losing the forest for the trees. Amen. Last question. You have lived a amazing life. You have been an amazing professional in your craft. There has to be one thing that you would want to tell your younger self now at your age that you might not have known, let's say, when you were 30. If there's one thing that you would tell your younger self, what would it be? Well, first of all, to pause occasionally, uh, not simply go on to the next uh, project or the next client or the next whatever, but to try to internalize some of that because um, life moves so fast over these last 47 years of my career. Uh, but it, it would be that. I think the thing I learned with alcoholism was that nothing in work ever bothered me. Uh, I always expected there to be reverses. I didn't expect to win everything. But when things happened in my private life, um, when my kids had an eye disease living the, leading to blindness, when my father died of cancer, when um, uh, we had a house in a beach city that had mold and we had to knock it down, I felt powerless. And I turned to addictive substances. I turned to alcohol. And the point is that if you are internally and spiritually uh, correct and at peace with yourself, you can live through anything and you can live through anything uh, without a crutch. Wow. Woo, I'm not going to forget that one anytime soon. Lee, thank you so much for your honesty, uh, your counsel, uh, your friendship, and I hope ours continues to deepen. Well, Michael, you've helped. You, you've helped so many different people in a quiet behind the scenes way. And um, thank you for the work you've done. Oh, thank you for that, Lee. I greatly appreciate it. And is there one last thing you want to talk about that you are promoting now? I know you have your academy. You've got a couple of books out as well. Is there anything that's happening towards the end of the year that you want to talk about? So we're constantly doing uh, agent academies and sports career conferences to try and refute situational ethics and show people that you are how you work and you can't be nice to cats and dogs and, and uh, go home and be a good person and then go out in the workplace and use social Darwin tactics because the end justifies the means. If you bifurcate yourself that way, it leads to a type of soul death. So the key is, you know, use this one lifetime to try and make a difference. Don't simply accept the way a system is or uh, circumstances. And I think the overriding issue of our time, first of all, can we get along? Can we treat everyone with respect? But then what are we doing to the planet Earth? We're making it uninhabitable for ourselves. And so when I said before, I asked my father what he did in the war, that they're going to ask us what we did to, to stop the world from being poisoned to live on for human beings. So true. 
Thank you so much for your time today, Lee. I really appreciate it. We're going to keep in touch, and thanks for watching Reputations in Crisis with Mike Paul, the Reputation Doctor. We'll have more soon. My RepDoc opinion of this Lee Steinberg interview starts with just amazing praise. Um, there's a lot of people who don't walk the talk, and Lee, obviously, just by listening to his words, but also listening to his heart, uh, is a man that walks the talk. He's been through ups and downs, he's fallen down and he's gotten up, and he's utilized not only his own example, but he clearly let us know that for the younger athletes that he's working with, he obviously leans on his retired athletes and his older athletes to be an example, not just in the lives that they've lived and the games that they've played, but as a resource to tap into when he wants to educate his athletes about how they need to be doing the right thing. I think that is amazing. Um, any man that has an addiction knows, and Lee talks about it often, that he takes one day at a time. And one of his key messages in his interview was at times just to pause. I even sometimes tell my four-year-old, just breathe. Just, you know, losing that game on your iPad uh, isn't the end of the world. Think of how you might not have gotten that point and how you can do it better the next time. Don't just be frustrated. From the mouth of babes, from the mouth of legends, what examples that we have in the world today on how to live an excellent life, to not just be the best athlete you can be, but to be the best human being you can be. Lee is not only an amazing agent, He's passing on by passing the baton to other agents to learn his craft. He's been doing this a long time. I believe he's 72 years old now. What an amazing legacy he has built, not only for himself, but for his family, but for all of sports and for all of us to learn from. We're going to keep on top of the athletes that Lee has as an agent, we're going to keep on top of what's happening in the NFL. In my opinion, the NFL still has a lot to do as a league. And quite frankly, a lot to pay back to especially the large amount of black athletes who play in that league who still are not treated equal. Not only within the league itself, but in the United States of America and in the world that we live. So I wear, as you saw earlier, I'll show it again, Colin Kaepernick's t-shirt as my t-shirt for today's interview for a very strong reason. We still have a lot of work to do, not only in professional sports, but in America in general. And when a man stakes not just his reputation and his brand, but his ability economically to feed himself and his family for the rest of his life and give it up, not just for himself, but for all of us, that deserves to be recognized, that deserves to be remembered, and that deserves to be echoed, not just with professional athletes, but for our children. So let's remember we all have a lot of work to do, athletes included, including their agents, and including those who watch this amazing sport, football, on a daily basis. Don't just watch it as a fan. Don't just judge those who go down on one knee. And let, let's make sure, just as Lee asked us to do, that we see the brotherhood amongst athletes as an example for us, not only as fans, but as Americans, to seek to have brotherhood amongst ourselves across races, across ages, 
and even across gender. Hopefully you liked today's show. Please go to our YouTube channel, which you'll see right here where you're watching this video on YouTube and just hit the red subscribe button. Or you can also listen to the audio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. And thank you for joining us today. And remember, less head work and more heart work. Peace.